Hi again, this is Andy, KE4GKP, and welcome back to the Ham Whisper and lesson 30 in the General Class Operator Element 3 exam course. In this lesson, we go over the G9A section of questions from the question pool. All right, the G9A section of questions covers antenna feed lines and specifically characteristics, impedance, and attenuation, SWR calculation, measurement and effects, and matching networks. All right, for the first question, which of the following factors help determine the characteristic impedance of a parallel conductor antenna feed line? Now, the answer is the distance between the centers of the conductors and the radius of the conductors. So keep in mind when we're talking parallel feed line, these are two wires that are side by side, not like coax, but more like ladder line or some other feed line where the two wires are side by side. So characteristic impedance is a theoretical notion. And when a wave travels through a transmission line, the ratio of voltage to current or E over I will eventually settle into a constant. Now this assumes that the transmission line is of infinite length and has absolutely no loss. So it's a magical mythical transmission line. You should also note that the, according to Ohm's law, the voltage divided by current or what we're talking about here, E over I, is equal to resistance. Now resistance and impedance are, are measured in ohms. So no matter where you measure the current and voltage along this theoretical transmission line, the ratio of voltage over current should be the same. So what this question is getting at is that the two factors which impact impedance on a parallel transmission line is how far the conductors are apart and how thick they are. What is the typical characteristic impedance of coaxial cables used for antenna feed lines at amateur stations? The answer is 50 and 75 ohms. And this is one that is probably just best to memorize. But most coaxial cable that you use for amateur stations are either 50 ohms or they're 75 ohms. Now 50 ohms is most commonly used by transmitters and transceivers. And 75 ohms is most commonly used by receivers. Is that a hard fast rule? No. but it's one of those ones you should probably just memorize and remember that 50 and 75 ohms are the ones you're most likely going to see associated with an amateur station. What is the characteristic impedance of flat ribbon TV type twin lead? The answer is 300 ohms and this is another one to memorize. Now flat ribbon TV type twin lead is essentially a you see this going up to old style TV antennas that aerials that you have on your roof. Um, it's generally a, a, a flat ribbon with two conductors in, in, on either side of the ribbon. So memorize this one. Flat ribbon TV type twin lead is the characteristic impedance is 300 ohms. What is a common reason for the occurrence of reflected power at the point where a feed line connects to an antenna? The answer is a difference between feed line impedance and antenna feed point impedance. And this is sort of the same idea as SWR caused by impedance mismatch between a transmitter and feed line, except this time we're talking between a feed line and an antenna. So basically when a, the signal from the feed line hits a higher impedance or opposition to current in the antenna, some of the signal's power is reflected back down the transmission line. So the common reason for the occurrence of reflected power at the point where a feed line connects to an antenna is the difference between feed line impedance and the antenna feed point impedance. What must be done to prevent standing waves on an antenna feed line? The answer is the antenna feed point impedance must be matched to the characteristic impedance of the feed line. Now this one goes back to the previous question when we're talking about the feed line and the antenna feed point. So this is between feed line and antenna. But the general theme when you're talking about re preventing um, standing waves in an antenna feed line or anywhere is to match impedances. So just kind of find that answer. So is to match, to minimize SWR, always match your impedances. Which of the following is a reason for using an inductively coupled matching network between the transmitter and parallel conductor feed line feeding an antenna? The answer is to match the unbalanced transmitter output to the balanced parallel conductor feed line. And this question sounds a bit crazy, and there's a few specifics in this question that if you pull out, it'll help you answer the question. The first thing you need to know is that feed lines are either balanced or they're unbalanced, and this is a result of the feed line's construction. What this question is, is talking about is a parallel conductor feed line. So parallel feed lines, like ladder lines, are all balanced. 
because the conductors are the same diameter and they're equidistant apart along the whole transmission line. Now, coax, on the other hand, is the two conductors have different diameters or different constructions in general, and as a result, have different impedances. So the majority of transmitters for amateur radio all are built to deal with unbalanced feed lines. So they're all basically built to deal with coaxial cable. So in order for a transmitter that's built to deal with an unbalanced feed line to work with a feed line that's balanced like a parallel conductor feed line, you need to have a impedance matching network to match the unbalanced transmitter output to the balanced parallel feed line. So that's what this question is getting at. How does the attenuation of coaxial cable change as the frequency of the signal it is carrying increases? Well, the attenuation increases. So basically, when you think attenuation, think loss. So attenuation is a reduction in signal strength, and it's expressed in decibels. So what this is saying is that as frequency increases, feed line losses increase. So attenuation, think feed line loss, as the frequency of a signal increases, the attenuation or loss through a coaxial cable also increases. In what values are RF feed line losses usually expressed? RF feed line losses are usually expressed in decibels per 100 feet. And this is a general standard which you should probably memorize. Of course it's not. You'll see it expressed differently. However, in general, 100 feet, you want to express feed line losses in decibels per 100 feet. What standing wave ratio will result from the connection of a 50 ohm feed line to a non-reactive load having a 200 ohm impedance? And the answer is 4 to 1. And to find SWR or standing wave ratio, it's a pretty simple thing. And so kind of right now, I would ignore the non-reactive load and all the other noise going on that question. The two things you want to focus on is the 50 ohm and the 200 ohm. To find the SWR, you simply divide the larger number by the smaller number. So in this case, you have the 200 ohm um, load divided by the 50 ohm feed line, which is 4 to 1, which gives you a standing wave ratio of 4 to 1. What standing wave ratio will result from a connection of a 50 ohm feed line to a non-reactive load having a 10 ohm impedance? The answer is 5 to 1, and you get this the same way you got the last question. If you divide the larger impedance by the smaller impedance, that's 50 divided by 10, or which comes to 5 to 1, and therefore you have a standing wave ratio of 5 to 1. What standing wave ratio will result from the connection of a 50 ohm feed line to a non-reactive load having a 50 ohm impedance? And the answer is 1 to 1. So you notice that both impedances are the same. Um, this is the ideal. You get divide 50 by 50, you get 1 over 1 or 1 to 1 SWR, which is exactly what you want. What would be the SWR if you feed a vertical antenna that has a 25 ohm feed point impedance with a 50 ohm coaxial cable? The answer is 2 to 1. Same idea as the last question. So you take the bigger impedance divided by the smaller impedance. You get two. Over, this, in this case, you get 50 over 25, which comes down. You reduce that to 2 over 1, and you get a 2 to 1 SWR. What would be the SWR if you feed a folded dipole antenna that has a 300 ohm feed point impedance with a 50 ohm coaxial cable? And the answer is 6 to 1, and same idea as the previous questions. You take the larger ohms divided by the smaller ohms. In this case, it would be 300 divided by 50. You reduce that down to 6 over 1, and that will give you the 6 to 1 SWR. If the SWR on an antenna feed line is 5 to 1 and a matching network at the transmitter end of the feed line is adjusted to 1 to 1 SWR, what is the resulting SWR on the feed line? And the answer is that it remains 5 to 1. And this is kind of a weird question. I'm not too sure what point they're trying to make out of this except for the fact that nothing's going to change the feed line's SWR. Now you can match impedance from the transmitter to the feed line, but if the feed line SWR is 5 to 1, it is what it is. So the, if the feed line SWR is 5 to 1, you have a matching network at the transmitter going into the feed line that adjusts the transmitter to feed line SWR to 1 to 1. 
the SWR along the feed line is still going to be 5 to 1. And the G9A review is over and it's time for the quiz. So take out a piece of paper and a pencil, number 1 through 14. I am going to go through the questions fairly quickly, so if you need more time, just pause the video. And when you're done, you can go to hamwhisper.com and check your answers. You can find them under the exam answers page under the G9A section of questions. So with that out of the way, let's get started with the quiz. Question 1. Which of the following factors help determine the characteristic impedance of a parallel conductor antenna feed line? A. The distance between the centers of the conductors and the radius of the conductors. B. The distance between the centers of the conductors and the length of the line. C. The radius of the conductors and the frequency of the signal. Or D. The frequency of the signal and the length of the line. Question 2. What is the typical characteristic impedance of coaxial cables used for amateur feed lines at amateur stations? A. 25 and 30 ohms. B. 50 and 75 ohms. C. 80 and 100 ohms. Or D. 500 and 750 ohms. Question 3. What is the characteristic impedance of flat ribbon TV type twin lead? A. 50 ohms. B. 75 ohms. C. 100 ohms. Or D. 300 ohms. Question 4. What is the common reason for the occurrence of reflected power at the point where a feed line connects to an antenna? A. Operating an antenna at its resonant frequency. B. Using more transmitter power than the antenna can handle. C. A difference between feed line impedance and antenna feed point impedance. Or D. Feeding the antenna with an unbalanced feed line. Question 5. What must be done to prevent standing waves on an antenna feed line? A. The antenna feed point must be at DC ground potential. B. The feed line must be cut to an odd number of electrical quarter wavelengths long. C. The feed line must be cut to an even number of physical half wavelengths long or D, the antenna feed point impedance must be matched to the characteristic impedance of the feed line. Question 6. Which of the following is a reason for using an inductively coupled matching network between the transmitter and parallel conductor feed line feeding an antenna? A, to increase the radiation resistance. B, to reduce spurious emissions. C, to match the unbalanced transmitter output to the balanced parallel conductor feed line or D, to reduce the feed point impedance of the antenna. Question 7. How does the attenuation of coaxial cable change as the frequency of the signal it is carrying increases? A, it is independent of frequency. B, it increases. C, it decreases. Or D, it reaches a maximum at approximately 800 MHz. Question 8. In what values are RF feed line losses usually expressed? A. Ohms per 1,000 feet. B. Decibels per 1,000 feet. C. Ohms per 100 feet. Or D. Decibels per 100 feet. Question 9. What standing wave ratio will result from the connection of a 50 ohm feed line to a non-reactive load having a 200 ohm impedance? A. 4 to 1. B. 1 to 4, C, 2 to 1, or D, 1 to 2. Question 10. What standing wave ratio will result from the connection of a 50 ohm feed line to a non-reactive load having a 10 ohm impedance? A, 2 to 1, B, 50 to 1, C, 1 to 5, or D, 5 to 1? Question 11. What standing wave ratio will result from the connection of a 50 ohm feed line to a non-reactive load having a 50 ohm impedance? A. 2 to 1 B. 1 to 1 C. 50 to 50 or D. 0 to 0 Question 12. What would be the SWR if you feed a vertical antenna that has a 25 ohm feed point impedance with a 50 ohm coaxial cable? A. 2 to 1 B. 2.5 to 1 C. 1.25 to 1, or D, you cannot determine SWR from impedance values. Question 13. What would be the SWR if you feed a folded dipole antenna that has a 300 ohm feed point impedance with a 50 ohm coaxial cable? A, 1.5 to 1, B, 3 to 1, C, 6 to 1, 
or D, you cannot determine SWR from impedance values. And question 14. If the SWR on an antenna feed line is 5 to 1, and a matching network at the transmitter end of the feed line is adjusted to 1 to 1 SWR, what is the resulting SWR on the feed line? A, 1 to 1, B, 5 to 1, C, between 1 to 1 and 5 to 1, depending on the characteristic impedance of the line, or D, between 1 to 1 and 5 to 1, depending on the reflected power of the transmitter. And that's all there is for Lesson 30. So now that you're done with the quiz, go to hamwhisper.com. You can check your answers under the exam answers page. You can find them under the G9A section of questions. And until next time, this is Andy, KE4GKP, saying 73, and I hope to hear you on the air soon.